I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my statutory interpretation and regulation class on the case United States v. Marshall, a Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals case from 1990 about judicial power and equitable interpretation. Now, for my students, in most of our cases about statutory interpretation, we've either looked at the kind of use of legislative history versus textualism, uh, focusing just on the words of the statute, or maybe the canons of construction. And almost all of those cases are really trying to figure out what the words in the statute means. This case is a little different. This case is about when should judges basically stretch the meaning or read a lot of things into the meaning just out of fairness or justice concern. So this, is, this case is a little bit more about the role of judges and sort of buffering some of the um, effects of the statute when they produce injustice. So let's go and look at our case and see what happens. So Marshall was convicted of selling LSD, as were some other defendants in this consolidated case. Marshall had been convicted of selling more than 10 grams, so he received a 20-year prison sentence, and the others had been convicted only for, uh, for selling only 5 grams, so they had received uh, 5 uh, or to 10 years each. And the appeals in this case are really just about the length of the sentences, not about their, they're not contesting their guilt um, or the fairness of their trials. Their uh, appeal is really just about how long their sentences were. And that's because of a kind of weird feature of the Controlled Substances Act. And that's our statute here, which is 21 USC 841B. And the provisions that uh, relate to LSD are the ones that are relevant for our case. And basically the statute says that anyone who knowingly or intentionally distributes a quote mixture or substance containing even a detectable amount of LSD shall receive a 10 year minimum sentence if it's 10 grams or more and five years minimum for cases of one gram or more. Now the typical dose of uh, LSD that's sold on the street to a customer um, is in that dose, the LSD is a tiny proportion of the total weight. Most of the weight of each dose is uh, that sold is actually the carrier medium, which here was paper, and that's kind of the most common. And so basically the LSD is uh, dissolved into, it is very, very potent. Um, it's so potent that a single dose worth of the pure chemical would basically be too small to see or to handle. And so <clears throat> it's uh, diluted in alcohol and then uh, they'll soak blotter paper uh, in it and the blot blotter paper uh, absorbs the solution. And then when the alcohol uh, evaporates, it leaves the um, LSD kind of mixed into the paper. And so you cut off a tiny square of the paper like shown here that you could pick with tweezers. And when you drop that in a glass of water or orange juice, the LSD will leach out. So this means you can fit 100 doses on one sheet of blotter paper. or um, And here, 1,000 doses would be on 10 sheets. And uh, 10 sheets of blotter paper weighs 6 grams. But the LSD that would be there, the actual drug, would be just 50 milligrams. Here's a, another picture showing. And basically, what users will do is cut off a tiny square and again, soak it, uh, uh, put that in a glass of water or orange juice or something like that. And the LSD will then leach out of the blotter paper. Um, and so the problem here is that the, uh, when we calculate the sentence for a convicted LSD dealer, the court, whether the court is supposed to include the weight of the carrier medium or the, the paper, or just the weight of the active drug. And the majority uh, here, which is Judge Easterbrook, um, held that the language and structure of the statute required the inclusion of the carrier medium. Now, Judge Poser, who was one of the most famous judges in the country at the time, wrote a dissent, and he said that the weight of the carrier medium should be excluded, even though he will concede that the statute seems to include it. Um, and, and the reason is that it produces unfair or irrational outcomes. And basically, if you think about it, the penalties will not correlate to culpability, like how many doses you sold or how much of the drug you sold. It's going to correlate to basically the weight of your carrier, your inert carrier medium 
um, which re really doesn't matter. So if you use, let's say, a heavier weight of blotter paper, you're going to be, be receive a heavier sentence, and your sentence is going to be mostly based on the carrier medium that you use instead of the doses of drug you sell. And this case really highlights the uh, contrast between the faithful agent approach to statutory interpretation, which is exemplified here by Judge Easterbrook, and the partnership approach uh, that's being taken in the dissent by Judge Posner. Now, the faithful agent idea is that you may remember from our casebook, is the idea that the judge is just there to kind of, as in the words of Justice Roberts, uh, to call balls and strikes, right? To, to ensure procedural, uh, proper procedure is followed and then to sort of rigidly um, implement whatever Congress wants. And so judges aren't supposed to think for themselves about whether what they're doing is fair or just, that's the job of Congress. And if you don't like the law, or the results, call your congressman. That's sort of the idea, and um, it's not the judge's role. Um, so the first approach will then imply that you apply a statute literally, even if it seems a little wrong. And the second approach that's being taken by Judge Posner thinks that judges actually are there for a reason. The judges are there to prevent injustices and unfairness and to uh, sort of act as a buffer uh, to the things that inherently go wrong with a democratic uh, legislature or de democratically elected legislature. So for example, you could have a, the majority who is trying to oppress a minority. You could have the Congress just didn't think through some of the consequences um, in individual cases uh, that, that would happen. And that's okay, because that's what judges are for. The judges aren't just mechanically implementing whatever Congress says and just kind of following orders, but rather that judges are have a, are, have a partnership uh, in the legal system with Congress to sort of uh, mitigate the effects or buffer the effects of the statute. Uh, Judge Posner has a section of his dissent where he expresses this eloquent, eloquently and says, the first approach buys political neutrality and a type of objectivity at the price of substantive injustice. In other words, judges, it, it, the faithful agent approach allows judges to deflect any responsibility for the injustices that are happening or unfairness of the law. And they can seem like they're just objective and following orders even when there's substantive injustice. And the second approach, which is the sort of partnership approach uh, Judge Posner thinks judges should take, buys justice in the individual case, but it comes at a price. And the price is considerable uncertainty and not infrequently judicial willfulness. Or in other words, judges leave themselves open to accusations of judicial activism. And also the more discretion a judge has to try to do the right thing in a case, the more it's gonna become unpredictable about what will happen in your case. The majority here feels bound by the wording of the statute. They say, look, this, the text is sufficiently rational. It's not a crazy law. It's not unconstitutional. It's not void on its face, even if it's problematic in practice. Um, I have pulled out a couple of quotes from the Easterbrook majority opinion to help clarify what's going on here in case you're lost. So first he explains how the LSD works under the statute. LSD is applied in <clears throat> to paper um, via a solvent. After the solvent evaporates, a tiny quantity of LSD remains in the paper. And because the fibers absorb the alcohol, the LSD solidifies inside the paper rather than on it. So you really can't pick a grain of LSD off the surface of the paper. Um, ordinary parlance calls the paper containing tiny crystals of LSD a mixture. Now, why is just Judge Easterbrook spelling all this out? Because he's saying that um, th there's really no other way to regulate this or legislate uh, about it uh, without accounting, including the carrier medium, because you just can't sell LSD as a recreational drug on the street in its pure chemical form, right? Uh, you, you would need just uh, um, uh, have to have micrograms, which are impossible to measure out and package and, and so forth. So he's explaining that inherent in the activity that's being criminalized by the statute is the problem of the carrier medium. And then he says, basically, Congress has to uh, just kind of uh, make general statutes. They can't account for every uh, 
um, sad case that might arise. So statutes rationally may be addressed to the main cases rather than the exceptions. And then he says something very interesting here. He says, Congress can count on prosecutorial discretion to take care of the absurd cases. And so one of the example hypotheticals that the dissent and the majority bat around is, what about somebody who takes one single dose and mixes it into like a gallon or a quart of lemonade, right? So that's a, they're going to get a really long sentence for just one dose. The, and that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And <clears throat> even though it's very, very diluted. And what Judge Easterbrook is saying is if you want somebody to kind of buffer the or or run interference for these weird cases or weird effects of the law. That's why we have prosecutorial discretion. That's the job of the prosecutors, not the job of the judges, right? So prosecutors have almost unfettered discretion in deciding whether to bring cases and what charges to file and, and, and uh, so on. And, um, and so they can mitigate these types of effects uh, rather than the judiciary having to kind of um, impose itself. And the majority has some other points too that are a little bit more along the lines of classic statutory interpretation. So they, they look at another provision of the same statute, the Controlled Substances Act, that deals with a different drug called PCP. And that section expressly distinguished between penalties for pure PCP from those which are attached to a mixture or substance containing a detectable amount. And from this same for the Congress intended the wording here with LSD to mean the opposite. This is a, a kind of sophisticated maneuver from a standpoint of interpreting a statute is to say, okay, so what the defendants want and what Judge Posner in the dissent wants um, us to do, the approach they want us to take, Congress expressly took in the next section, right, of the statute. And so, which seems to suggest albeit this is an argument from silence, that they deliberately decided not to do that here, right? It's not like they just weren't thinking. They thought of this very problem in another section of the statute that they passed at the same time. So that kind of begs the question, why didn't they do it about the LSD section? And it, maybe we should presume it was intentional. Now, Judge Posner, um, in his dissent, had argued that even if Marshall's sentence is sort of fair um, or not crazy, he can come up with a lot of hypothetical situations that will arise under the majority's approach, which would be um, absurd sentences. And the majority says, well, that's all well and good. Those are the cases before us. And in fact, there's nothing in the record indicating that those things are even happening, right? The record doesn't show that we're getting a lot of preposterously high sentences, like maximum 10-year sentences for single doses of, um, uh, of LSD. And then from a policy standpoint, the majority noted that other statutes take care of the problem of the, the punishments not correlating to guilt necessarily. So uh, Posner says, look, the problem is that a regular street user or purchaser who basically gets one dose to sell to their roommate too, an extra dose, is gonna be punished the same as a cartel leader. And uh, the majority says, you know what, there's other statutes and other section of the statutes um, that are going to mitigate that effect and make sure that the kind of the top of the food chain, uh, the cartel leader, the gang leader, or, or the big importer is going to face more severe penalties um, than the, uh, kind of casual buyer and reseller. And then the majority also resents to, or, or re, tries to rebut Judge Posner's suggestion that Congress just didn't think through um, the reality of carrier mediums and the fact that people were basically being punished based on the length of their sentence would be based on the carrier medium. If they used a heavier weight of paper, they would get a, um, a, a longer sentence, Posner says, and instead of um, the person who sold more dose, doses getting a longer sentence. And the majority says, uh, that's all well and good, but you're making it sound like Congress was ignorant. And the record really indicates that Congress tried to inform themselves. They had lots of hearings. They brought in lots of experts from law enforcement uh, to testify at their hearings about the distribution patterns of all the drugs that are covered under the Sub Controlled Substances Act. So Congress wasn't just winging it. 
they really did engage in a lot of information gathering from um, the people who explained how different drugs work in the retail uh, market. Um, and the dilution rate of LSD, by the way, is not terribly different than the dilution rate for a lot of other illegal drugs like cocaine and heroin. And so the majority notes that maybe Congress just decided not to account for dilution rates when it imposed sentences based on rate uh, on weight because it's that's just part of the uh, drug business. Now, Posner, uh, uh, going back to his dissent for a moment, as I mentioned, he'll talk about how Marshall received a 10-year sentence. And Marshall had sold um, about 11,000 or tw almost 12,000 doses on blotter paper. And remember, that means um, there's 100 doses on each piece of blotter paper, each sheet. Um, and then Posner compares this. He, he's not saying, think of poor Marshall sitting in jail for 10 years. He's saying, um, uh, look, but... The, a, a hypothetical dealer, if he could get his hands on the pure substance itself, um, it could sell 200,000 doses, uh, like worth of doses of, by molecular weight, let's say, and they would get a shorter sentence. And, um, and basically then compares uh, what Marshall sentence to if he had sold um, heroin or cocaine and, say, and says the results here are completely out of proportion. Now, for my students, I want to notice something and connect this to some other cases we studied about the absurdity doctrine. There's, in some ways, this should remind you of that, right, that the, Judge, Judge Posner's concerns are similar to that. But he doesn't invoke the absurdity doctrine here, because remember, the absurdity doctrine is premised on the idea that Congress or the legislature would never have intended the result that the statute would seem to um, mandate in this individual case. And he's not saying that Congress would never have intended Marshall to get um, the, as long a sentence as he did. He's, um, uh, or, or even that Congress didn't intend severe outcomes. Instead, his argument is a little different. He's saying judges have some prerogatives and responsibilities to interpret the law through a lens of rationality and fairness. And that concludes our lecture about U.S. v. Marshall.